ஓம் சகனாவத சகனோனத்து சீரியங்கரவாவகை தேஜஸ்வினாவதீதமஸ்து மாவிஷாவகை ஷாந்திஷாந்திஷாந்தூர்ணமூர்ணமிதம் பூர்ணமுதச்சியூர்ணமேவாவசிஷ்யோஷாந்திஷாந்திஷாந்திசாரியமாச்சாரியப்பந்த வந்தே குருபரம்பராம்ருதிஸ்மிருதிபுராணாம்லயங்கருணாலயம்மாவிபவாரியணம் சூத்திரவாஷ்யே ஈஸ்வரோரமே மூர்த்திவேதவிமவியாத்தேஹா மூர்த்தோதிதா ியாசேனிகிரிதாராணமுனிமேமாவர்ஷிணீம்வதீம்ஷாமனுசந்தீவத் ீதேவந்திவ்யைஸ்தவைவேதைவக்கிரமோபனிஷதைவஸ்திதன மனச பாஷ்யோகிஸ்மைனமிஸ் third chapter of the bhagavad gita chapter is called karma yoga then the main subject matter is performance of karma of our duties yoga with the attitude of yoga <coughs> in fact this is already taught in the second chapter the teaching in the second chapter was complete really in other matters as vashika adi shankara said explains and as lord krishna also will explain in this third chapter the very first verse that we have selected that bhagavad gita teaches the spiritual pursuit in two stages the veda is in fact in the introduction of bhagavad gita adi shankara jay explains that vedo hi vedokto dharma that the veda teaches dharma what is dharma the righteous way of living or right way of living what is dharma living a life 
in accordance with the prevailing order in the universe. So there is an order in the universe, a harmony in the universe. You call it a law, which in fact governs everything, which sustains everything, which upholds everything. That because of which we find a harmony in the whole universe. Among countless entities which make up this universe, we find a harmony. We find a very smooth, harmonious functioning of the universe where different elements of nature perform their activities or duties in a very specified, predictable manner. The sun rises at a given time, sets at a given time, so does the moon, so do the stars, the earth, water, fire, all the different elements of nature, all of them perform their functions in a enjoined manner, in a predictable manner, in a manner which follows the, the law or the harmony of the universe. We find they function in harmony with one another, not in competition to one another. Right? Where there is harmony, where there is cooperation rather with one another, not in competition, where there is cooperation, there is harmony, where there is competition, there is conflict. So we find harmony in the universe. That's because all the entities making up the universe, beginning from a subatomic particle, all the way up to the largest galaxies, all of them function in cooperation manner. Therefore, there is harmony. <coughs> So even our observation of the universe also suggests that there seems to be a law, seems to be something that unifies the whole universe. It's called universe. That even though apparently there are various diverse elements unconnected to each other outwardly, sometimes we may not see any connection between two things outwardly. But nothing is isolated, it is one organic whole. The universe is one organic whole, not inorganic whole. Like our body is one organic whole. The body consists of many limbs and many organs. Each one of them different from the other. Each one has its own location, its own name. It's one action, the head is in its own place, performs a certain action or plays a certain role, legs have their own place, hands have their own place, and thus every cell has its own place. All of these appear different from each other, unconnected to each other, but there is one, it's an organic whole. This is one cell that informs all the parts of the body, something that unifies the body. There is a unity in diversity. There is oneness in many. There is sameness in what outwardly looks dissimilar. Sameness in dissimilar. Unity in diversity. Harmony or order in what may outwardly appear unorderly. When you earthquakes and hurricanes and tornadoes looks like it's all a destructive world. So there are sometimes pockets where there seems to be like a disharmony but then if you look at the whole overall universe it all fits into its place. Everything has a role to perform. Everything has a place. Into everything 
directly or indirectly contributes to the harmony of the universe. Because the scientists will tell us, if earthquakes did not happen, this earth could not survive. If hurricanes did not happen, there would not be a balance in this, the universe. So all of these, which appear to be very inconvenient to us, all of them have a role to play. The point is that, looked as a whole, not as isolated events. An isolated event may appear to be disarmoning, in disarmoning. When we look at it as a whole, we see the harmony. You know, life also, when you take an isolated event, we perhaps find it's devastating. But then when you look at perhaps the life as a whole, we we take that on the past and future and which, for which we don't have the knowledge, we will find that whatever happens in the present has a purpose to serve. <clears throat> Sometimes that purpose may be clear, very often the purpose is not clear, but nothing ever happens without a purpose. Nothing ever happens without a cause. Had it not been the case, there would not have been, science would not have been possible. Because science works on predictability. That the effect is according to the cause. The reaction is equal and opposite to action. That there is a cause and effect chain that connects everything. And thus, that there is a harmony, there is a law, there is unity, there is universal principle. And the whole universe functions in harmony with that principle. Therefore, what would be an appropriate way of life? That human being also should function in harmony with that universal principle. If we comply with that law, then there is harmony within us. If we violate the law, there is disharmony or conflict within us. As a matter of our experience, we know that sometimes our commitment to truth or honesty is tested. When something is at stake, not, not, not always, when something is at stake, maybe when a lot of money is involved, when my prestige is involved, somebody near and dear is involved, then the truth, honesty, all of these are sometimes tested. Because to remain honest, I may have to sacrifice something which is very dear to me. So, sometimes we are controlled by that impulse which is dictated by my attachment to something. That my son is more important than honesty or truthfulness. My wealth is more important than honesty. In which case, very often, I compromise the truth. I may compromise the honesty. But it brings about a conflict in my mind. Within myself, I know that I have done something wrong, something that is not right. And basically, I love to do what is right. The reason why the conflict arises, that when we find ourselves consciously doing something which is not right, consciously saying something, doing something, eating something, whatever, which we know is not right, where we are compelled by some pressure inside. Something pressurizes the Swami, this Rasagulla, take it. Even though doctor has told me what my sugar levels are and what is right for me. So what is right for me is to avoid that Rasagulla. What, what my mind likes to do 
he has put it in my mouth. So conflict between what is right and what I like. Sometimes what I like is different from what is right. And I find myself being controlled by my impulse of doing what is what I like. Later on I regret in my mind. I should not have done it. <clears throat> so please, you would like to please come and sit, join us. A special seat for you. Here is a hard seat for you. So that conflict shows that there is a law. Here also we know that when we violate the law, we are likely to be punished. So driving on the road is very tempting. There is no, the road is open, no traffic. It's recently resurfaced road and I just have a new car. There is a temptation. And that fellow is hiding behind, the traffic patrolman is hiding behind the bushes. He just, you know, trails me. So how, when we violate the law, we are liable to be punished? Similarly also in nature, when we violate the law, we will be punished. Here, you may have those sensors which tell you that there is a traffic patrolman within one mile and so you must slow down. But there are no, but as far as the universal law is concerned, if you violate the law, there is definite consequences. Anyway, the purpose of all this is that there is a law and therefore there is a right way of living and there is a non-right way of living. A right way of living which is conducive to harmony and happiness and an unrighteous way of living which creates conflict and unhappiness. This human being has always this dvandra or pairs of opposites, happiness and unhappiness. If both are all right with us, no problem. If happiness was acceptable to us, okay, do what you want to do. But no, happiness, we do not, unhappiness, we do not want. We want happiness. That is why, if what came to you was all right with you, no rule is necessary. But what comes to me is not always all right to me. I have likes and dislikes. I like certain things, I do not like other things. I like happiness, I do not like unhappiness. I like honor, I do not like dishonor. I like respect, I do not like disrespect. I. Therefore, it is important that I should conduct myself in such a manner that I do not create that conflict for myself that there is happiness in life. So that is the role that the Vedas play, the scriptures play is to prescribe a way of life which is conducive to being happy. So do a given thing which will create happiness for you and avoid doing given thing because doing that will create unhappiness for you. Or you can say that I am the one who creates happiness for me and I am the one who creates unhappiness for me. That is why the Hinduism or the Vedic tradition religion talks of law of karma, law of cause and effect, which teaches us to take responsibility of our life. Karmanyavadi karaste, you have the responsibility to do what is right. You cannot claim ignorance about, I did not know that this was, I am sorry, I did not know that hitting you was wrong. I did not know insulting you was wrong. 
I didn't know stealing was wrong. You cannot claim that ignorance. Because you know what is right and what is wrong. That consciousness is given to us. We know what is right and what is wrong. How do we know? Because we are very clear about how we want to be treated by other people. I want to be treated with kindness by others. I do not want others to be cruel to me. I want them to be kind to me. If I have made a mistake, I want them to forgive me and not punish me. So we know how I want to be treated by others and how I do not want to be treated by others. I want others to be kind, compassionate, charitable, giving, forgiving. I do not want them to be cruel, angry, insulting, stealing, lying. All of us are equally aware of this. This I know what I expect from others. I know that others also expect a similar kind of behavior from me. If that part I did not know, then there would have been escape. I know that I want you to be kind to me. So what I did not know, that you want me to be kind to you. I did not know. I was not conscious of that. Then, even if I am cruel to you, I can't be faulted. If I did not know that you also want me to be kind to you, if I did not know that, then my cruelty cannot be faulted. But as a human being with the most evolved consciousness, not only do I know what I expect from others, but also know what others expect from me. You know, why do I say human being being most evolved in consciousness is that other creatures do not know this other part. They all know how they want to be treated by others. Nobody wants to be killed by others or hurt by others. Every creature loves to live. And there is self-preservation instinct. Because it's very clear that I don't want to die. I don't want pain. I don't want to be hurt. However, they do not seem to know the other creature doesn't want to die. You follow? A cat very well knows that it doesn't want to die or want to be hurt. But does not seem to know that a mouse also doesn't want to be hurt. Understand this is very important. Therefore, when a cat makes a mouse its breakfast, it has no sense of guilt. Understand this. When we do something which we know is wrong, there is sense of guilt. Other creatures have no guilt. They have no hurt, they have no guilt. If you hit a dog, he will feel pain momentarily. Well, he forgets. Doesn't feel that it doesn't, there is injustice there and this and complain and stuff like that. Or it is not eaten in that long time. If a dog bites you, doesn't have any guilt. No hurt, no guilt. Human being is hurt and guilt. There is a price you have to pay for being the most evolved creatures. They are not evolved. Therefore, they don't have to pay the price. Therefore, one animal can make, one creature can make another creature its food without feeling guilty. Had there been guilt, this whole universe would come to a stop. Suppose cat felt guilty, no, no, I can't kill the mouse, they will be hungry. Understand that it can't survive, isn't it? Jivo jivasya jivanam. One life form depends upon other life form for its survival. That's how the nature is and that's how the balance is maintained. If there's guilt in these fellows, then 
a lizard cannot catch all those moths. Oh, I can't get it. That's not right. No. It does it without any sense of guilt. That's how the circle, the creation goes on. Otherwise, creation would not go on. Meaning that the Creator has provided enough amount of consciousness to a given creature which is needed for it to survive and for it to contribute into the scheme of things. The human being, the Creator has given this much more evolved consciousness because of which there is hurt and guilt. Is it good or not? Would it not be nice if there was no hurt? You insulted me, I did not feel anything, would it not be nice? Or I insulted you, I did not feel guilty, would it not be nice? No pain, isn't it? All our pain comes from hurt and guilt. Emotional pain. Physical pain is a different thing. But other creatures do not have, do not have emotional pain. They may have for a period of time, yes. When a mother loses her child, yes, yes, there is sadness for a period of time. Then they forget. They don't have those memories that goes on for the whole life. All unconscious, you know, that keeps on, uh, you know, uh, forming their personality, etc. They don't have that. We have that. Is it good to have the hurt and guilt? And all the pain, emotional pain that comes from there, that's what we call samsara. Or would it not be nice if you did not have no hurt, no guilt, no pain, no emotional pain? Go on with your life. How would you like? How will you describe, I mean, how do you know happiness if you don't have unhappiness? No, no. Even a cow knows happiness. When you give it grass, it is happy. The creatures also, when they get what they want, they are happy. Not that they are not happy. But understand that a problem is given to us for solving that problem. When there is no problem, there is no solution. If problem creates unhappiness, sadness, solution creates happiness. Solution creates happiness. Not just, it is not that unhappiness creates happiness. Unhappiness is the awareness of sadness. Unhappiness is given to me. And I do not, I know that I do not want unhappiness. Therefore, I will make a conscious effort to become free from unhappiness and becoming happy. So you find human being making a conscious effort to avoid unhappiness and acquire happiness. Sukha praptehi dukkha nivrutti. Sukha praptehi attainment of happiness. Dukkha nivrutti avoiding unhappiness. However, Mr. Swamiji, if everybody wants happiness and everybody avoids unhappiness, how can we find different people doing different things? Should they not all be doing the same thing? How come? Somebody does a given thing for happiness, other fellow gives up the very same thing for happiness. It's amazing. Here is a car, which I think is an old car. I know what problems there are. I want to get rid of it. Put it on sale on internet. There's somebody who comes, he wants to buy the same car. So one transaction. The getting rid of the car makes me happy. Other thing is I got a good deal. <coughs> Acquiring the very same car makes other fellow happy. It's amazing. How even though the objective is common of seeking happiness and avoiding unhappiness. We find different people doing altogether different things, even opposite things. Why would that be? 
because everybody has his or her own idea of what will make him or her happy. Because we have been given a mind and intellect with which to think, with which to judge, which which to conclude. So it is the nature of our intellect to judge and conclude. So we are a bunch of our own conclusions. I have a conclusion that this makes me happy, this makes me unhappy, from my experiences. Others will have their own conclusions of what makes them happy, what makes them unhappy. However, as experiences change, my conclusions also are likely to change, meaning today what I think would make me happy is possible that tomorrow I may think that no, that's not, doesn't make me happy, makes me unhappy, it's possible. <coughs> meaning that the conclusions are in a state of flux, so, but at any given time, point in time, it is my conclusions that guide me what to do. And thus, this is our pursuit, searching for happiness, avoiding unhappiness. This is simple as that. That's all we want in our life is happiness. Unmixed with unhappiness, put it this way. If we are our way, what we want, would want is have happiness and no trace of unhappiness. Therefore, the goal of human life is described in Sanskrit as Atyantika Dukha Nivritti Niriti Se Sukha Avapti Atyantika Dukha Nivritti Cessation of Dukha Cessation of pain Atyantika Once and for all Cessation of pain or sorrow once and for all Niriti Se Sukha Avapti Avapti and attainment of unsurpassable happiness for once and for all. Meaning that I want that all ha unhappiness should go away and never come back. And I want that all happiness should come and never go away. That's what we want. That's a common desire in everybody. We are all born with that natural desire. It is not that, that we desire to desire. Isn't that someday I desire that I don't want unhappiness and I want happiness? Not someday. If it happens someday, that means that before that I wanted unhappiness. No. It's a natural desire. A natural dislike for unhappiness, a natural like for happiness. A natural attachment for happiness, natural aversion for unhappiness. Meaning that we are born with a tendency of attachment and aversion. Basically what I love is happiness. What I hate is unhappiness. So my love for happiness gets transferred to what I look upon as a source of happiness. You follow? My love for happiness gets transferred to what I consider the source of happiness. So Super Bowl, you know, it's gone, isn't it? It's gone. Yeah. The World Series also gone. Okay. Even the, uh, the basketball also is gone. What is that series called? I don't know. Whatever it is called. Everything is gone now. This is July, so all those games are over. But, huh? Wimbledon. Wow. That's tomorrow? Day after, day after tomorrow. It's the final. So, if I look upon that as a source of happiness, I, then I love that. The attachment arises from my conclusion that a given thing is a source of happiness for me, and aversion arises from my conclusion that a given thing is a source of unhappiness for me. My conclusion, understand, at a given point in time, they are subject to change. The whom attachment and aversion will change. What is attachment? My basic attachment for happiness is transferred to what I look upon as a source of happiness. 
and my basic aversion of unhappiness is transferred to what I look upon as source of unhappiness. So mother-in-law, whatever, source of unhappiness, daughter-in-law, mother-in-law, spouse, boss, colleagues, neighbors, ex- anything. Conclusion about all of them. And therefore, attachment or aversion. I am not saying mother-in-law means only good, bad, whatever it is. Any person. Persons, situations, happenings, events, we have opinion about everything. It is the nature of our intellect to opinion about everything. Judgment about everything. We cannot function in our life without judgment or opinion. And that judgment or opinion is what? Source of happiness, source of unhappiness. Or potential source of happiness, potential source of unhappiness. Therefore, I like it, I dislike it. I want it, I don't want it. Each one of them creates an activity. So it does, does not simply say, stay, you know, stop at the opinion. When I like something, I want it. When I want it, I must do something about it, so karma comes. So my basic attachment for happiness and aversion for unhappiness creates attachments and aversions for things and beings of the world which I look upon as sources of happiness and unhappiness, which in turn creates a desire to acquire and possess and enjoy that which is source of happiness to avoid, get rid of that which I look upon as source of unhappiness. That desire that creates an action requiring, possessing, experiencing or getting rid of it. That's our life. Whatever life, actions that we perform. Our life is characterized by action is deliberate action, not just action. Two kinds of action, voluntary and involuntary. So breathing etc. are not called action in as much as no voluntariness is involved. But right now I am talking, that's a voluntary action. We have freedom not to talk. So thus, only human being is capable of performing deliberate action, premeditated action. The human being can perform, no other creature is gifted with that kind of a thing, they always, they seem to generally act on their impulse. So meaning that when a cat looks at the mouse, first impulse is to attack it. Whereas, when, as our Swami used to describe, somebody insults me and I want to punish that person or kick that person. I lift my right leg. Look at that person, 6 feet 3 inches, 250 pounds, I am 5 feet 3 inches, 150 pounds. I look at that person and slowly my leg comes down. <laughs> Not so in case of a donkey. But Swami used to typically describe a donkey has a habit of always facing the wall. That's how it stands. So doesn't know who is behind him. But then, for a donkey, the hind leg is the strongest leg. It kicks with the hind leg. So when it finds somebody is there behind and feels a little threatened, right away it kicks. Likely that it is own owner who is be sitting, standing behind that. May kick. Because no thinking involved. No premeditation, no deliberation involved. I mean, no deliberation involved. And may get punished also. Whereas I have an impulse of kicking, but I have deliberation of the consequences. And therefore, I withdraw from that action. So human being is given the gift of performing deliberate action. Understand? Everybody acts, but human being has a distinction that I perform a deliberate action. Because 
I have a choice not to perform an action. Donkey doesn't have a choice not to kick. An impulse to kick happens, it kicks. I have a choice not to kick. When the impulse of kicking happens, I have a choice not to kick. That's a very important thing. Kardum shakyam, akardum shakyam, anyathava akardum shakyam. A choice to do, not to do, or do it as I like to do. We have that choice. That's called free will. That choice is does not seem to be available to other creatures. It's not our interest to brand other creatures. It's just only for comparison and study and understanding. Suppose tomorrow you come up and say, Swami, they are free will. I have no objection to that. Oh, Swami, they also perform direct. Maybe they perform. We have no objection to that. We are not interested in branding them one way or the other. This is just to show the distinction that a human being enjoys. So that we know what distinctions we enjoy, what gift we have, what freedom we have, and never what responsibility we have. That's important. When freedom is given, that freedom becomes a blessing if that freedom is exercised with responsibility and that very freedom becomes a curse if exercised without responsibility. And the freedom to kick, if I exercise that without responsibility, I'll be smashed by that fellow. So freedom is there. It is likely that Whenever, sometimes people do this thoughtless thing, they just do and they hit him without thinking. What are the consequences? We also do very often things without really taking into account the consequences. This is called impulsive action. An action performed without taking into account the consequences of action. On the spur of the moment is called an impulsive action. Understand the difference between a spontaneous action and an impulsive action. People sometimes come, I spontaneously did it. No, you impulsively did it. So what is spontaneity? When you are effortlessly right. So there are three kinds of actions. An impulsive action, a deliberate action, and a spontaneous action. Very often we are impulsive, meaning that we are dictated by our impulses. I get angry and say something. I am jealous, I do something. So very often we perform actions as pressurized by or as impelled by such forces as anger, lust, greed, jealousy, hatred, or to kill all white people. Kill white policemen. So that has happened, that impulse. Shoot them. Only human being can do that. So that is a premeditated, deliberate action. Where three fellows are standing with their guns, rifles. Shoot them. You won't find them with lions and tigers that are waiting and doing something, you know. No, they do it as their instinct tells them to. Again, there is not judging anything, it is simply understanding. We are observing this to understand, that's all it is. Not to judge anything, neither to judge ourselves. So when we understand what uniqueness a human being has, and what the consequences are, uniqueness is that you, as human beings we have free will. And the consequences are that if we use our free will wisely, we help ourselves. If we use that free will unwisely, abuse that freedom, then we hurt ourselves. <clears throat> In the scheme of things, as we say, there is a law or there is a harmony. So where does the law come into picture? When there is freedom to violate the law. Otherwise, there is no need for a law. 
There's no law that you should not walk in air. Is there a law like that? Should not walk in the air. Should not drink fire. Do they tell you no? Because you are not likely to do that at all. We are likely to do speed limit 25 miles an hour. The city speed limit 25 miles an hour. We are likely to exceed. Likely to abuse the freedom. Violate the freedom. Because there seems to be a natural instinct to violate the law. To have our own likes, dislikes, our own course. Unfortunately, when it comes to the nature, then we cannot escape the consequences. Whenever we violate the law, we hurt ourselves. Whenever we follow the law, we help ourselves. This human being is in a very unique position, either to help himself or hurt himself. Therefore, we need guidance. Therefore, we need a GPS. Because we can take any road. There is no destination, you don't need GPS, understand? What is it? It is for a drive, going for a drive. Go for a drive, no GPS, because there is no destination, understand? Hmm? As far as all the nature other than human beings is concerned, there is no destination. So no GPS. No scriptures, no lectures like this among buffalo and cows because no GPS scriptures necessary. Human being has a destination. Because he likes something, he doesn't like something else. He has free will. He can make choices. And therefore, it is necessary that he should make right choices. For that, he needs a guidance. He needs the GPS. This is what? Gita positioning system. That GPS we need. The Gita positioning system. That's what we need. So thus, Bhagavad Gita is the text which is an essence of, as you say, the Vedas. Essence of the entire Vedas. And Vedas teach us two things. Life of activity, life of engagement, and life of disengagement. Vedas teach us two life, not two lifestyles, two stages of life. Life of activity and life of contemplation. Therefore, the human life is typically divided into four stages. Like of four ashramas of four stages. Brahmacharya, Grahastha, Varaprastha, Sanyasa. So Brahmacharya is life of preparation. For the other three, for particular Brahmacharya, all life of a student is primarily for preparation for Grahastha Ashrama or life of activity. Before you participate in the world, before you live a responsible life, there must be education of how to live. So Brahmachari goes to a teacher and gets education of how to live. Dharma is what he is taught. What is Dharma? The righteous way of living. And that is communicated in the form of do's and don'ts. We need both. Do this and don't do this. If you do this, you will help yourself. If you do that, you will hurt yourself. <coughs> Since we can help ourselves as well as hurt ourselves, therefore we should know what, doing what will help ourselves and doing what will hurt ourselves. Vidhi and Nishedha. Vidhi, do's. Nishedha, don'ts. Therefore we find that the first part of Veda which concerns itself with how to live Life of engagement with the world, interaction with the world, because that's how that's the first stage of growth. The first stage of growth for human being is the right engagement with the world. 
understand that the Vedas do not teach us renunciation like running away from life, never. The first stage is how to live properly in this world. That is how to conduct yourself, how to relate to the world. What are your duties with reference to your family, with reference to your neighborhood, with reference to your society, etc., etc. It's called dharma. Taught as do's, called vidhi. And the opposite is taught as don'ts, as nishedha. Therefore, the first part of the Veda, called karmakanda, which teaches us how to live a life of engagement, is in the form of vidhi and nishedha, do's and don'ts. If you live life that way, that is called the responsible way of living. Dharmic way of living, meaning living a life in harmony with the prevailing law. Since we don't know the road, therefore we need GPS. So we don't know the road of life, therefore we need that GPS in terms of what to do. So it says make a right turn, means what? Don't make a left turn. So when you come to intersection, three choices are there, right, left and straight. Make a right. 300 feet, make a right. Means not left, not straight. Take a U-turn. <laughs> or of course, if you make a mistake, so take a, you make a U-turn. Recalculating, etc., etc. They are very kind. That's called price chitta karma. <laughs> we have, if you make a mistake, there is price chitta karma. So, how to atone for that fault? So, that is also there. <clears throat> but then, so we need this. Because we don't know the road ahead. Therefore, we need that guidance at every stage. So, Vidhi and Nisheda. If you follow the GPS sincerely, see that requires Vairagya. Because GPS says make a right turn. But that is a road with all potholes all broken down in winter. The left road of life looks so good, recently resurfaced, very tempting, you can drive well. So you feel like taking that road. GPS says take this road to take the road on the right. You must have vairagya for road on the left as well as road on that straight, isn't it? Unless we have vairagya for, vairagya, you know what is vairagya now? Comes from an understanding, wisdom. The, even though that looks good, it takes me away from my destination. Just because something looks good doesn't mean that it is right. What is right? That which leads to my destination is right. Whether it is rough, painful, whatever it is, and still, it is quite likely that what is right may be not smooth. What is right may be a rough road, a hilly road, climbing up and down. You may require care. All of that you may require. But all that is worthwhile because it is leading you to your destination. Therefore, we require Vairagya. Very often, People fall for what they call immediate gratification. On that road, exciting. So you take it and enjoy the excitement of speed. That is called immediate gratification. Ultimately, wind up in a place where you get totally lost and you are so far away from where you want to go that you create a lot of pain for yourself. Because now there is no, nothing there, no hotels, nothing, no food, nothing at all, you know. Here you had all those things, all been ready for you, nothing there. It looks good, the consequence is what? Pain. What in the beginning looks very pleasurable, ends in pain, is wrong, adharma. What looks rather painful in the beginning, but results into something which is pleasurable, is dharma. So, Dharma requires not only a trust in the GPS. Oh, this stupid GPS doesn't know. No, no, no. 
can't say like a trust. Secondly, it's self-restraint. What is the restraint? That I must restrain the temptation of taking the other roads even though they appear to be tempting. A self-restraint to prevent my mind from controlling me to take that wrong path. Self-control is required, which comes from Vairagya, which comes from Viveka. Understanding of what I want, what I do not want. So this takes me where I do not want, so I don't want that. This takes me where I want, so I want that. Viveka, Vairagya. This is how life of a householder is. Not a simple life. Every stage we are supposed to do what is right. And there are many temptations of taking the easy way out, going for immediate gratification and not thinking of long-term consequences. And that is how we wind up damaging ourselves. Therefore, the life of activity is called life of dharma. <coughs> if you live life that way, in course of time, it makes us mature people. Emotionally Muslim person who now enjoys a mastery over himself because he is constantly exercised self-restraint wherever his mind has a tendency to violate or mind a tendency to take liberty, I restrain myself. But in course of time, in the beginning, it requires an effort. Ultimately, becomes spontaneous. So third way of life, impulsive way of life, just doing what appears attractive. <coughs> Going left, right, or left and right. Deliberate, taking right. Even though it doesn't look attractive, but I deliberate. And I realize that that's the right thing to do. And ultimately, it will grow on me that I do not need any direction. I spontaneously do what is right. You follow? In the beginning, I, do, I deliberately do what is right because I have a tendency to do wrong. As long as there are tendencies to do wrong, I must be deliberate in doing what is right. A time comes when those tendencies to do what is wrong get erased from my mind and I effortlessly do what is right. That's called spontaneous. Impulsive, deliberate, spontaneous. So Bhagavad Gita teaches us two things. How to be deliberate and what is spontaneity. So living a deliberate life is called Karma Yoga. And leading a life of contemplation <coughs> which leads to spontaneous is called Jnana Yoga. Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga. Life of engagement or activity, life of contemplation. Thus our scriptures recognize the spiritual growth of a human being is occurring in two stages. Therefore, the final stage is called sannyasa, renunciation, not throwing away, not running away, but having developed that maturity. Now, the person is ready for the life of contemplation. So, this is how the first verse that we have selected, the third chapter, tells us how there are not two lifestyles, how the spiritual pursuit is in two stages. So let us read that verse. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Loke smin vividhanishtha Loke smin vividhanishtha 
पुरा प्रोक्ता मया न ज्ञान योगेन सांख्या कर्म योगेन श्री भगवान वाच लॉर्ड कृष्णा से इज इन रिस्पॉन्स टू द डाउट एक्सप्रेस बाय अर्जुना अर्जुना वॉज एंड श्योर somehow from the teaching of the second chapter he thought that there are two separate paths to moksha karma is one path gnana is other path somehow that is what arjuna may have understood <coughs> there is not what lord krishna say but perhaps lord krishna may not clarify certain things or specify certain things and that way is likely that one may come away with this conclusion from the second chapter because in second chapter lord krishna talked about karma yoga also lord krishna talked about gnanam also karma nivadikaraste ma phale shukadaja all those verses talked about karma yoga न जायते मेते वा कदाचि नाम भूत्वा अजो नित्य शाश्वतो एवं पुराण ज्ञान होगा सो लॉर्ड कृष्ण इज टॉक अबाउट बोथ सो वन मे कम अवे विद इंप्रेशन दैट यू कैन हैव अ चॉइस आई डू परफॉर्म कर्म और टू परस्यू द नॉलेज दैट दे आर इक्वल फुटिंग एंड देयर वर यू हैव अ चॉइस of taking either path one is right other is left meaning what is by right and left what we mean is that the path of karma requires to engage in activity whereas the path of gnanam is a life of contemplation requires you to disengage from activity we'll talk about that and one person cannot do both simultaneously he cannot be active as well engaged as well as disengaged so arjuna is confused what should i do o oh lord should i take up to the life of karma or life of gnana tadekam vadanishchitya yena shreyo ham aapnayam vyamishrene vakyena बुद्धि मोह शिव में तदेक वद निश्चित ये नो हम तदेक निश्चित वद ओ लॉर्ड यू प्लीज डिसाइड फॉर मी एक बिकॉज आई नो दैट आई कैन नॉट डू बोथ ऑफ देम टुगेदर वन रिक्वायर्स एंगेजमेंट इन एक्टिविटी अदर रिक्वायर्स डिसंगेजमेंट बोथ ऑफ दिस कैन नॉट बी सैमलटेनिय डन बाय वन पर्सन So I cannot do both of them together. As I would have done, so I can do. Then you tell me what is best for me. Should I engage in activity or should I renounce and contemplate? In response to this doubt expressed by Arjuna, Lord Krishna says, "Hey Arjuna." they are not two independent paths the karma and gnana are not two independent paths they are in fact two stages of one path na two paths but two stages of one path where karma yoga is the first stage and gnana yoga is the second stage that's how lord krishna commences the discussion on the third chapter and we will conclude here tonight and continue tomorrow morning <coughs> and before we close this if there are any questions uh, kindly stand up and ask so we can clarify i want to question you know, humans are on this earth for time so long 
if I came after that, that is my understanding. Now, when the man was born on this earth, millions of years back, God gave him a pleasure center, a neurochemical called serotonin for the pleasure, and also give, as you say, feeling of guilt. Do we need really Gita? When God gave us pleasure center, a chemical for the pleasure, and also gave us the intellect and the guilt. Why do we need Gita? That's my question. Very good question. That God has given us the pleasure center, with which we can experience the pleasure, and uh, we also have a guilt. So why do we need Gita? The thing is that, the pleasure center gives us experience of pleasure. We have to understand that experience. Where does the pleasure come from? So when you eat a, a, you know, a piece of candy, or a plate of ice cream, that is the pleasure center which experiences pleasure. Therefore, our conclusion is that the pleasure or happiness came from a candy, came from ice cream, right? Please, please keep standing so that I can talk to you. Yeah. So what's your name, sir? My name is Mahasuk. Mahasuk. Mahasuk, very good. Wonderful. See, he's Mahasuk. He definitely doesn't need me. Yeah. <laughs> so now the thing is, we interpret that experience of pleasure or happiness and come to conclusion that the happiness came from a candy, from ice cream, from an object of pleasure. That's what we conclude when we say the intelligence also is given and it is the nature of intellect to judge and conclude. Whether this conclusion is right or not is a question. If this conclusion was right, we don't need Gita. Unfortunately, this conclusion is wrong. Our conclusion that happiness came from candy is not the right conclusion because if happiness comes from candy, all we need is to store candies in our home. And you keep on consuming candy every half an hour. You'll be happy. <coughs> but what we find is the law of diminishing return. First candy gives you a certain quantum of happiness. Second candy, less. Third candy, less. Seventh candy may make you miserable also. <coughs> if candy was a source of happiness, it should consistently make me happy. But what makes me happy now is also capable of making me unhappy in a different condition. Therefore, this conclusion that happiness came from candy is a wrong conclusion. Meaning that we are born with wrong programming, born with wrong GPS, where our intellect tells us and guides us, which happens to be all wrong or quite contrary to our interests because we are born with ignorance. And ignorance has created a programming of GPS in our mind, which is quite wrong. And therefore, Human being is a miserable creature. Human being is, if I was a happy person, even the gift that God has given to me, my intellect and sense in whatever it is, if I was a happy person, you don't need Gita. But with what God has given me in terms of my intellect, in terms of my thinking capacity, my judgment, my conclusions, my experiences, and all the things that I have and I can have. If it's all of this, I was a happy person. We do not need Gita. But in spite of having what all I want, lots of things I want and I have them. In spite of having everything that I want, I still find myself not a happy person. Not the one who is satisfied. And therefore, we need Gita. Because we are unhappy people, therefore we need Gita. Again, if unhappiness is acceptable, you don't need Gita. 
we find us unhappy and unhappiness is not acceptable to us. If you're unhappy, it's all right, okay. Don't need Gita. But we find us unhappy and we do not want unhappiness. We want happiness. Therefore we need Gita meaning we need that guidance as to how to do because we have desire. We have this desire and agenda. We are born not with something like other creatures are born without an agenda. They are born as you describe. That they have a center and they have this, that and what not and they live their life. No agenda. We are born with an agenda. What's the agenda? I want to be happy. What happens as you say, we do not want a trace of unhappiness and we want all happiness. That's the agenda. In Vedanta they call it moksha. Moksha is a big word, very intimidating word, but it means very simple thing. Moksha means what? Freedom, total freedom, once and for all from all unhappiness and attainment of all happiness, called moksha. Each one of us is born with an agenda. What is agenda? With a desire for a destination. So we have a destination in life. Therefore, there must be a right way, only then we can reach destination. But unfortunately, the kind of understanding we are born with is wrong. And therefore, if we lead our life based on our understanding and conclusion, we seem to create unhappiness for ourselves. So everywhere we see human being creating unhappiness for himself and for others. So whatever unhappiness is there in the world is all created by human beings. Poor creatures and you know, we create all kinds of problems for them. But we create them. If wherever there is any unhappiness, even there is starvation in, in some place in the world, in, in I don't know, British some, some place. It is also we have created it. <clears throat> Violence, starvation, all abuse. Abuse of women, abuse of all, all, all those who are weak. All of that is all created by human being. Meaning that human being is capable of creating unhappiness for himself and for others. And therefore also we need guidance. So that is why we need Gita, which is a guidance. Son, now you say. You know, uh, you talk, uh, uh, you say that our laksha should be moksha. The freedom from desire, the freedom from unhappiness, the freedom from all the attachment which makes us unhappy. The Gita came, I don't know how many years back, possibly 6,000, 7,000 or 10,000 years back. The people who were living on this earth before Gita, they, they never went to moksha, they never got moksha. Only people who came to know Gita, they went to moksha. Does it mean that way? Now there is a different question. So you are settled with what we discussed, that we need Gita. I, I learned today from you, this GPS, I yeah. really like it. I, I mean, really, it helped me. Okay, now. So now the question is, what was happening before Gita came? Understand that Gita came maybe six, seven, ten thousand years, whatever it is. But before that also we had this knowledge. So Pura, this verse says, Pura Prokta Mayanagha, Here Arjuna, even along with the creation, I have set in motion this knowledge. So we are those sages. We had those rishis and sages, all ancient, who had the knowledge and who passed on. So Upanishads came much earlier than Gita. So Veda is an ancient text. And they say that this has no beginning. It is as old as creation. So knowledge has been there. It is systematized as the time goes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yes. So with that we will conclude tonight. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyade Purnasya Purnamadapya Purnamevavashishyade Om Shanti Shanti
शांति हरि ओ श्री गुरुभ्यो नमः हरि ओम